Ui. Amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. It's cold outside, but I'm like uh, Minister Lucky. It's warm up in here. Amen and amen and amen again. We praise God for your presence and this opportunity to stand before you to preach the word of God. We ask that uh, you would be, that you would uh, know that uh, Pastor Hamilton is a daddy again. Uh, baby boy Hamilton is here. And he's just as cute as a button. Uh, we are waiting on the name. We've been, <laughs> they, they, they are working that out. I think he must think he got to wait until the eighth day, you know, and all that kind of stuff. At any rate, we praise God for our pastor and First Lady Hamilton. She is doing well and, and all are well this morning. Amen. Uh, from me, first thing I want to do is to say thank you to all of you who have uh, given me all kinds of uh, encouragement, both tangible and verbal. You have been a blessing to me in my life. I just certainly hope that I have returned in kind some kind of blessing to you. You have um, fed me and you have encouraged me to do the work that God has given uh, me to do in this place, in this branch of Zion. And I just want to say to you, Shiloh, I love you. And I am praying for you all the time. And I ask that you will do the same. Amen. I'd like if you would, if you would uh, please stand and let us read our scripture for the morning. I've only given you one verse because the other uh, pericope of scripture, you'd be standing until uh, probably about 9 o'clock. So I didn't want to give you all of that. So please stand and let us read uh, together the Ephesians 2 uh, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now while you're on your feet, turn to your neighbor and say, by grace. Turn to your other neighbor and say, through faith. And then finally, speak it into the atmosphere. It is the gift of God. All right, you may be seated in the sanctuary, our Father and our God. Again, we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. This is your servant. You know me. We've been talking and talking. We've been walking and walking. And Lord God, when I would go left, you turned me right to make me go straight. When I would say things that were not of you, you'd say, stop. That's not what I've given you to do. So, Lord God, I just say thank you for being in my life. I say thank you, Lord God, for guiding me, for empowering me, for baptizing me by your anointing. Now, Lord God, let me move out of the way. You've given me the time to study. You've helped me prepare the message. Let the people hear from you so that in the end they will be edified. Lord God, you will be glorified and the very devil will be horrified by what these people will do. We say thank you and we praise you. This is your servant's prayer. With thanksgiving, let all of God's people say amen. 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 I want to talk to you this morning, and I'm not going to be very, very long, about a paradigm shift. Uh, those are words that are used in the world when um, things are happening and there's about to be a change. But in the paradigm shift that I want to bring to you, it's a paradigm shift from law to grace. I'm going to talk to you this morning, if I may, about a law attitude and a grace attitude. Say grace attitude. I need to do that because Paul is writing to us in this letter in Ephesus. And this is one of those circular letters. It didn't just go to Ephesus. This letter went to other churches in Asia Minor. So it wasn't really addressed to the church at Ephesus, but it was simply addressed as one of those epistles that went from church to church to church. And it helped the churches stay focused. 
Paul writes to expand the horizons of his readers. He writes so that they will understand God's eternal purpose and grace. He writes to them uh, so that they will, so that they can appreciate the high goals that God has for the church. And that's where we are. So our theme scripture, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, let anyone should boast, is where we are going to begin. However, what we've discovered as we were exegeting this particular passage of scripture is that back in Matthew, when uh, Jesus was walking with his disciples, uh, he tells them a parable. And you can read this parable at your own leisure sometime, but it's the parable in Matthew, the 20th chapter, and it begins in verse 1. Listen, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. Now, a denarius is one day's pay. That is what he agreed to pay the early workers that he commissioned. And at about nine in the morning, he went out and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you, you, also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and he did the same thing and about five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? And they replied, because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. I need to stop right there because it is there that we come into this paradigm shift. See, the paradigm shift is from this law attitude to this grace attitude. Some 2,000 years ago, uh, we are still talking about grace attitude. We're even still talking about the law. Even in the 21st century, we are having challenges. See, grace is a hard thing for most of us to comprehend. See, grace is something you get when you don't have to do anything to get it. Isn't that what the passage says? It is not a works. It is a what? It's a gift. Say it again. It's a gift. It's a gift of It's a gift of God. So you didn't do anything to get the gift. So it is very, very difficult when somebody walks up to you and gives you something and you go like, huh? What? What did I do? And they say, oh, it's just for you and walk away. Usually the expression on our faces, and I've been there, has been one of dumbfoundness. Did I do something? What did I do? And I have to go back through my head and I'm I'm trying to figure it out. You know, did I write a letter? Did I say something? Not that important. It's a grace gift. It's just been given. It's a gift. The law attitude or the grace attitude is one that I want to clarify for you this morning so that we can move forward. You see, in this particular parable, it is important for us to remember that uh, the law attitude is, um, is going to be manifested in the next uh, portion that I will read. Listen, I'm on verse 8. When evening came, this is the best part, The owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages. Now that was fine, but listen to this. Beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. Now you know what happened. All mm, broke loose. It was like, oh, no, no, no. I've been here all day long. I have worked all day long. And he's going to wait until the end to pay me. He's going to pay everybody else. And then he's going to pay me last. Now, you know they had an attitude. And you know what I'm talking about. Shake your head like this. We have all been there. By the way, this sermon is for you. This sermon is for you. All right? So, finally... The day ends and the owner tells the foreman to pay them from the last to the first. 
And the first thing that this particular story exposes is the law attitude of what I call presumption. See, the, the law attitude of presumption says that I know what's going to happen next. See, the law attitude of presumption simply says I have already determined in my mind I have an expectation that this is going to happen this way. And when this doesn't happen this way, the first thing that comes out of my mouth is something that sounds like, hmm, I don't know what's going on here, but I don't like it. That's called discontent. Now, discontent is fine. Discontent is it's just natural. We can complain, not a problem. Complaining is a good thing because generally when you complain, you're trying to fix something that's wrong. It, it's a necessity. You know, the Grecian widows complained to the apostles because they were not being treated fairly uh, with the distribution of the food. So they took care of that. That was a good complaint. But when you go from discontent and complaining to this last one, we're in trouble. It's called murmuring. You know what that's like. Murmuring moves from person to person, and it really doesn't solve anything. So, first thing we have is this law attitude of presumption. See, the order was broken because generally, first to are hired are the first to be paid. The, it, the, 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 the presumption here is that we would be paid first. The owner turns it upside down, topsy-turvy. And when you get into topsy-turvy, that means the last shall be first. The comment, I came first and should not get paid, should not get better treatment than those who have just come on the job. That is the, the law attitude of presumption. I used this, and, and I thought about this not too long ago. Uh, my daughter called me up, and she said, Mom, I'm sitting a pack, sending a package, and it'll be there on Tuesday, and you'll really like it. Now, I already had a presumption of what it was going to be. I like the little packages she sends. You know, they're really very nice. She does all of this uh, creative kind of stuff. So I'm just waiting. Now, number one, I came back home that Saturday, and there's this little thing sticking on my door. That means that uh, the post office came already. She said they were coming Tuesday. So you know I'm already, like, out of sorts. So... I said, okay, so Tuesday, uh, Saturday, and this is before the holiday, we can't pick it up until Tuesday, and then we have to go and pick it up because they're not going to come and bring it back. So you, you understand what happens when you're all out of sorts, when you have these presumptions. So finally we got the package and we opened it up and we went like, oh, that's nice. We had already determined up here what it was going to be, and it wasn't what we thought it was. My, 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 thanks be to God for grace. The law of attitude says, this is what I presume. But the law, the grace attitude says, the owner has sole proprietorship. The owner determines what it will be. See, I don't own it. Therefore, whatever it is, it is. Friend, it's what the word says. I want to give the one who came last the same as I gave you. That's the word of God. In addition, I am God and I own the gift of grace. Say amen if you can. Well, God says, I bade them come in to do the work. And when they came in to do the work, I set all of the rules for service. He says, I determine the rewards. You don't. He says, and I exact the promise. Say amen if you can. That's God. Recognizing God as the proprietor, the owner, the creator of all things. We have to respect honor and worship him. See, he's creator. He stepped out into nothing and created everything. See, there was no matter. God created matter. Let me explain something to you. Folk now 
scientists, all of these people, they're not creating anything. They are simply fashioning from what God has all cre already created what is. They are inventors at best. So be careful when you say, well, I created that. Baby, you ain't created nothing. Because if matter hadn't been here before, you couldn't do it. Say amen if you can. God says, I am the owner. So let's kill this law attitude of presumption and come into the grace attitude that God is creator. Read your scripture. Read it out loud. Read your scripture. Read it out loud. For what? For by grace. Keep going. Don't put it away. This is participatory. For by grace, keep your scripture handy. Well, the second law attitude that comes about is the law attitude of comparison. Now, we're really good at this one. Oh, we're, we're, my pay is unfair and I should get more. I, and I think God did it that way, or the owner did it that way, because he wanted the first to see what he paid the last. Because you know that's really not the way it usually goes. Nobody really knows until it's time for you to be paid. But in this topsy-turvy story, in this parable that Jesus is sharing with his disciples on grace attitude, he's teaching them something. And we should be learning the same. How do they pay me the same as they pay the worker who just got here? I've been here since early morning, like 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. I've been working my bippy off all day long. He goes out, gets him, 5 p.m. He maybe work one or two hours, and he gets a denarius because that's what they pay the last worker, a denarius. And, of course, the last worker said, thank you very much. <laughs> and moved off the scene. And then the worker who came at 3 o'clock said, thank you very much, and moved off the scene. But now we have those first workers. Those are the ones, the law attitude. This is the comparison. The owner, and, 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 I, I, and, and this is where we come. I say again, thanks be to God for grace and a grace attitude. See, the owner is God, who is also sovereign. Not only is he creator, he makes everything, but he's sovereign. He rules over everything. It is his providential will to do as he will. If he wants you to have five denarius, he can do that. If he wants you to have one, he can do that. Because only he is the one who grants grace. At any hour of the day, he can give you grace. In every circumstance, he can give you grace. The song, Oh for Grace to trust him more. At any instance, through any circumstance and any trial, God calls you out. Why are you still standing here? Come work in my vineyard. Why do you persist in your sins? Why don't you just come on? Why do you keep sitting in the pew and not doing everything that I've given you gifts and talents to do. Why don't you come into the vineyard? You can come early in the morning. You can come 8 in mid-morning or 9. You can come 12 at noonday. You can come 3 in the early afternoon. You can come at 5 o'clock. It doesn't matter. Why don't you come? God rules and super rules. God has dominion over all things. He has power and strength and might. And he's supreme in all his ways. You know his real name is? Do you know what it is? Sovereign Lord. Did you know that? God's name is Sovereign Lord. And he grants grace. Read your scripture. For... Not only is there the law attitude of presumption, the law attitude of comparison, 
There's also this law attitude of self-absorption. Say amen if you can. This is a hard sermon to preach. But self-absorption simply says just that. I'm all about me. I know I'm fine and I'm dressed to the nines. You know, that's self-absorption. I walk down the hall and everybody just spread, moves out the way. Because here I come. Self-absorption. Self-absorption, the, 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 the murmurers said there are gross inequities here. And this is the way they said it, just like this. The denarius was too much for the little work they did. You know, I'm doing this thing. It's called looking down your nose at folk. Help me, Holy Ghost. They should not have been brought in at such a late hour anyway. Now, now they're talking to God. Huh? I'm backing up about right now. You telling God what God should do, what God could do, what God can do? Come on. When most of the work had already been done, why'd you do that? We were hired first, and we did the bulk of the work to bring it home. Use your sanctified imag imagination. It's all about me. It's all about myself. It's all about mine. It's all about who I know. It's all about anybody that I bring in. It's all about me. I'm not concerned about anybody else. I'm only concerned about me. Self-absorption. Not only is God sole proprietor and sovereign Lord, but he is savior and sacrifice. That's the grace attitude. If we could remember when we were saved, when we were on our last dime, when we were so low that we had to look up to see the bottom, if we could only remember when we weren't uh, driving, two, didn't have two cars and, and one on the street somewhere, if we can remember when we didn't have enough money for gas to get from point A to point B, if we can remember when we only had two nickels to rub together, then maybe... Just maybe the law attitude of self-absorption would not be a part of who we are. Help me, Holy Ghost. He's Savior and he's sacrifice. He's the grace gift. It's not about you. It's all about him. It's not about me. It's all about him. God sent his son, the second person of the Godhead, to be our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Son of the living God. He took the human form, came down through 42 generations just to be born in a little manger. And, and every Christmas about this time we go, behold the Lamb of God. He is worthy to be praised. We are so glad and we have moments of remembrance when we see what happens. That he came as a baby and, three years, and 33 years later he's hanging on a cross for us. He is our grace gift. God sent his son as savior. He sent him as the sacrifice. Do you know that Jesus Christ is the denarius? He is God's payment for us. Read the scripture. Read the scripture. For by grace are we saved through what? Faith. And not uh, I want you to put yourself there. Ourselves. Keep going. Last but not least, and I'm going to get out of your way. The law attitude of distortion. We've done presumption. We have expectations about what will happen, what God will do. We've talked about uh, comparison. We just come, the law attitude of comparison. We, we like to pit each other against each other. Not here. I mean, it's, it's just not general. It's, it, all of us have done one or the other. Come on. Then there is this, this law of self-absorption. You know, we have moments when we're really feeling high on ourselves. And then there is the last, this one of distortion. That means we take everything and we distort it. Uh, it becomes so distorted we can't recognize it. See, the murmurers judged everybody. They didn't care about those who needed 
Jesus. They didn't care about those who needed work. They didn't care about those who needed to be in service. They only cared about themselves. That's what this distortion is all about. The judgment. They did not deserve to be in the same agreement. That was the thinking. They came in off the street and they were, and they are not like us. They don't look like us. They don't dress like us. They don't, you know, how the us's go. That's distortion. They never saw them as part of the body of the service force. I'm not talking work now. I'm talking service. They saw the denarius as their payment for work in the kingdom. But thanks be to God for the grace and for a grace attitude. For every law attitude, there is a grace attitude. Do you desire a grace attitude? That's a real question. Do you desire a grace attitude? Are you ready for a grace attitude? Do you have a burning inside for a grace attitude? Are you passionate and, and ready to give yourself to the cause by choice, not by obligation? You can't do anything by obligation. If you're going to be obligated, oh, I got to go, so and so. If you got to go, don't. That's victim language. I'm ready to go. What's next? If you are enthusiastic in your response to God's grace, my, 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 I said you have a grace attitude working in your spirit. See, a grace attitude is, is that which is endowed by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus came and he died, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will leave you a comforter. And this comforter will come and indwell you. And, and when I look about, and when I think about that, my, my, fir my first feeling and thought was, if you're poor in spirit, then you have a grace attitude that says yours will be the kingdom of heaven. If, if, if you're sad and you're mourning, the grace attitude says you shall be what? Comforted. If you're meek and, and you, 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 you're not making it quite right, the grace attitude says that you shall inherit the earth. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, then the grace attitude says you shall be filled. That's the Holy Ghost. If you're pure in heart, the grace attitude says you shall see God. If you're a peacemaker, then the grace attitude says you shall be called the sons of God. If you are persecuted and reviled of men for Christ's sake, then he says to you, your grace attitude is rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. A grace attitude will result in three things. If you don't remember anything else from this sermon, remember this. The law attitude is all about me. But the grace attitude will result in three things. The first is forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I, I, I left my perfect clothes at home. I'm not perfect, so I need forgiveness. If I said something wrong, if I did something to you, and you, I don't even know what it was, just forgive me. If you, and if you want, come up to me and tell me, you did so and so and so, I didn't like it, please, and I'll go, please forgive me. Grace attitude has forgiveness. That's a result, not condemnation. You can't keep pushing folk down, can't condemn them. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who love God. The second thing that you'll get in a grace attitude is life. You're going to get life on this side more abundantly. And God promises you eternal life when you leave this place. The third thing you will get in a grace attitude is righteousness. Now, I ain't talking about putting on, well, I'm just so holy and so pot. No, that's not righteousness. That's self-righteousness. Righteousness is of God. He imputes it to you. When you are having a grace or when you have a grace attitude, you will have righteousness of God, not sin.
You'll find yourself on your knees more than you've ever been on your knees before. Because every time you step left, you will know that it's wrong. The Holy Spirit will convict you and put you on your knees. I guarantee you, my brothers and my sisters, the law attitude is moved out of the way. That went out over 2,000 years ago, and some of us are still clinging to it. Pull up grace. Grace is of God. It is a gift. He sent his son to give us the gift of grace. There's a hymn, and I love the hymn, written by a slave uh, master on a ship and would bring slaves in. And, and he was convicted on one of his journeys. I think he almost lost his ship and almost lost the cargo. And he, he, he penned the words to the song. He said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, my fears release, how precious is for that grace to appear. I just leave with you this morning, my brothers and my sisters, that there is a shift in paradigm. It is in the church, and it's called a grace attitude. The gospel has been preached. Why don't you stand to your feet? while you're on your feet I need you to close your eyes because somebody needs to know that you don't need to see where they're coming from and how they're coming but there's somebody here today who's trying to find their way back home they met Jesus a long time ago but they haven't been able to get back into the fellowship and I'm just opening up the doors of the church for them right now. If you're here today and you've been out there on a stormy sea, drifting along, you don't have a church family, you just hop from church to church, or you come whenever you get around to it, and it's okay. I'm glad you're here. The doors of the church are open for you. Won't you come? Won't you come and be a part of a of, of a band of Christians who are working on their grace attitude. We promise to love you. We promise not to be so caught up in ourselves that we can't lend you a helping hand. We promise to say to you in your darkest hours, we'll be here for you. I know this church, they will be there for you. If you're here today, won't you come? There's somebody else here. And the person who, uh, the other person who is here, amen, amen, praise Sister God. Stacy, amen, praise God, praise, praise God. God. There's somebody else here. You have never professed hope and faith in Jesus Christ. And you've been trying to figure this thing out. You've been balancing it. You know, you come to church and you do this. I see you, you're moving from left to right. You, you, the Holy Spirit is working on you. Won't you come? Why don't you come for baptism and to give your life to Christ? Won't you come? Bad Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Won't you come? Is there yet another? Is there yet another? I'm calling on you. I'm calling on you. I know you're here. We'll wait for you. All over the building. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 